Hello, everyone. This is Alexander Hora again. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, if you like what I'm doing on my videos and the stuff I'm doing on my website, if you'd like to support the show, uh, you could donate to me through uh, PayPal at alexhora at gmail.com, or you can also donate with Give, Send, Go. And any amount will be really appreciated if you could do that, because I want to be able to do this, you know, full time. And I really enjoy making these videos. And, and if you could help me, that will be really appreciated. So I'll show you how to spell my email. And here's Give, Send, Go. So I really like this. This is my um, Give, Send, Go account. And here is my email, alexhora at gmail.com. So you can just uh, send money through PayPal. You can send like recurring payments if you wanted to donate like every month, like say $5 or something. That would be cool. Or you can just send a one time donation. And here's my website, the Free American Press. So if you just like what I'm doing um, with my YouTube channel and want to show support, if you can, you can donate. And I would just like to thank everyone uh, who, who was able to do that. And if you can't, I completely understand. And if you could just subscribe to the channel, that would be really great too. So I'd just like to thank you all for your support. Uh, have a good day. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. This is the Free American Press with your host, Alexander Horat. Today, we're going to be having the president, Miles Franklin, on the show, Andy Schickman. But before we get into it, if you could please subscribe to the channel and leave on the and leave a like on this video, that would be really appreciated. Hello, Andy. Thank you for being on the show. Good to see you, Alex. Thanks for having me, buddy. Oh, uh, thanks for <coughs> on. So I wanted to ask you what you thought of what was going on right now uh, the, with the Federal Reserve and everything that they're doing. Well, um, it's kind of a big topic, but the Fed just made, met the other day for their federal open market uh, committee meeting. And uh, they made it clear that their uh, intents were to eventually taper at some point, whatever that means, uh, which I'd like to talk about, I guess. Uh, and, but that they would not be raising rates anytime soon. Um, which is just more of the same nonsense. And, you know, in 2008, when the uh, market collapsed, I think the number that the Fed was buying at that point, when all hell was breaking loose, I think the number was $90 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities and treasuries and what have you. And this was considered an extraordinarily large amount, blew the minds of most of the economists at the time. And here we are uh, in, in 2021, and we're being fed this narrative that everything is great and that the stock market is red hot and the economy is red hot and, you know, the recession is over and everything's great. And yet now in that environment, they're continuing to hold interest rates down, keeping uh, the wealth effect in order. But more startling than that, if everything is so great, then why are they continuing to buy $150 billion a month of these assets, if you will, $60 billion more than they were in 2008 when all hell was breaking loose? Uh, at the same time in 08, the balance sheet by the Fed was at 800 billion, it's now at 8 trillion, at least. So it's up tenfold and everything is supposedly great. Um, maybe even more startling were the June merchandise trade deficit, um, which was the biggest in history, actually. Um, 91.2 or $3 billion and you know, here again, we're being fed this narrative that the economy must be great because people are buying all this stuff. But it's actually the opposite of that. The economy is quite weak uh, because it's not what you consume, it's what you produce. Uh, it's because the Fed continues to print all this money and throw it from helicopters that we are buying all of this stuff but we continue to produce much less than we consume. Uh, and, and that to me um, actually uh, it exhibits weakness, uh, not strength. 
And uh, it, it's, it's the Fed's stimulus. The, the monetary policy that the Fed has us on has allowed people to consume uh, with money that, you know, really was just more or less provided to them. And this is what's creating distortions, misallocations, um, and uh, price chain uh, or, or price inflation and supply chain problems. So not a, not a good thing. So the Fed basically came out and said more of the same nonsense, that they're going to hold interest rates down by buying the back end of the bond. And that's evidenced by the fact that you have seen interest rates. Since you and I started doing these a, a month or six weeks ago, the interest rate on the 10-year treasury has fallen from 1.7 to 1.1 or so. And that's a massive move. At a period of time where this was a transitory, which I don't believe is transitory, this inflation, by their own numbers, is almost 6%. But we're seeing other people who gauge, like John Williams, the Chapwood Index. These are uh, legends in the industry who base their analysis and conclusions upon the way the met numbers used to be calculated before they were changed to fit this agenda, where the Fed bases its policy upon full employment and, uh, and, and interest rates, or excuse me, and inflation. So, you know, Powell did come out and say, that they're not going to stop doing this stuff until we see more uh, full employment. And, and that was more uh, of a disingenuous comment as well, because, you know, in 2019, after three rate cuts, uh, when unemployment was at, you know, 50 years low, uh, 50 year lows at that point of, of, uh, of 3.5%, but the Fed cut rates three times then. So it's disingenuous uh, completely and totally, or disingenuous completely and totally that uh, he says we're waiting until the employment numbers get better. 2019 shows that to be totally a farce, but we're being told interest rates from John Williams and Shadows and, and, and Chapwood is closer to 13%. And so, but the bottom line is, is that the Fed is buying back into the bond market holding the prices low because no one else is foolish enough to buy a 10 year investment earning 1% when inflation, even by their own statistics is almost six times that. You're guaranteed to lose between five and 6% compounding year over year for a decade. And if you believe what John Williams is saying with the Chapwood Index, you're talking double digit losses every single year compounding for 10 years. So. Uh, you have a situation where the Fed is trying to control the narrative, buying the back end of the bond market, continuing to, to funnel $150 billion a month into crap assets, uh, creating this wealth effect and a narrative that is uh, leading us down a very, a very scary place as far as I'm concerned, Alex. So what do you think this path will lead us to eventually? Hyperstagflation. Uh, I think we are heading there right now. Stagflation is an environment where you see rising prices calculated, uh, or excuse me, uh, associated with little or no economic growth. And when you realize what they are doing right now in terms of inflating the money supply, you see, if the money supply and the number of goods and services were rising at the same pace, you wouldn't really have to worry about inflation. But what you see right now is massive unproductivity. People aren't working. They're being paid to sit on the couch. And so you have massive supply chain distortions. In, in um, Austrian economics, they talk about all of these manipulations and all of these uh, uh, misallocations. And they talk about how this creates um, it, within the economy, it creates distortions, misallocations of capital, uh, and, and difficulty uh, discovering what fair prices are. And the only way to cleanse the whole system is like a forest fire to burn it all out. But, you know, when, when you talk about what's happening right now, uh, you have uh, all this money being thrown at people with poor productivity and supply chain problems that are creating... Uh, higher prices with fewer things to buy. So you have more money chasing less stuff. 
This is classic price inflation. And as we see this productivity, this, this, this lack of productivity increase, it only exacerbates the situation. Now, if we see more problems with this Delta variant and, and you see country or states rather locked down again, the small businesses that have been hanging on by a thread that have always been 40% of the GDP in, in that neighborhood, the backbone of the U.S. economy, they're dying. Uh, here in Florida, where it's more open than most places, you go to a restaurant and it says, you know, bear with us, we're really short staffed. So as is, the, the small business is, is hanging on by a thread um, and costs are rising across the board. In fact, just uh, a few weeks ago, one of the billionaire uh, food wholesaler, one of the biggest in, in North America, came out and said that by October, he sees food prices rising 12 to 15 percent. So, you know, how does, how does any of this uh, make us believe that, that things are as good as we're being told? Because if they were, the Fed would start to let interest rates normalize instead of worry about holding them down so much. The Fed would stop buying all of these assets. Uh, and, and as they, you know, they continue to do 150 billion a month in asset purchases, they'd stop. And you would see a much different environment, but really what we're seeing is more fuel being poured on a fire. The holding down of interest rates encourages more debt. People go deeper into debt. You see greater misallocations of capital, greater supply chain problems, higher prices, and we're being told it's transitory. It's not. People have to start to think, well, what if it's not? And to prepare for higher prices. And, uh, and that's the way that I see things. And by their very dovish, uh, inactivity uh, and doing basically nothing and saying, well, when we get full employment, we'll, we'll think about stopping these asset purchases. And, you know, it's, it's all very scary, actually, Alex. I, I think we're heading down a, a, a road where uh, the printing press meets the Great Depression. And I hope in both cases, it's less than I see in my mind's eye. Yeah, definitely. So why do you think the Federal Reserve would do something like this then? Uh, to continue to kick the can down the road. They've reached a point where they realize they can't let interest rates rise. If they do, everything collapses. You have the greatest mountain of debt accumulated at the lowest interest rates in human history. And I think they realize that they're caught. Uh, you see, if they back away from all these asset purchases and this easy money, then ultimately, under its own weight, the market collapses, interest rates ought to rise if being left alone, uh, they would rise. And you would witness a, a massive deflation of asset prices, and you would see interest rates rise, which would only exacerbate and collapse things worse. Um, and so I think they realize that they have to continue to do this. And But the funny thing is, is that the continuance of what they're doing leads to massive inflation which ultimately raises interest rates. In other words, both roads, even though they're going in different directions, circle back and lead to the same place at some point. And so I think they're choosing the less painful of the two. Uh, they'll always choose the printing press over austerity. It allows them to stay in power longer before, uh, you know, before people storm the gates with pitchforks and flames, uh, you know, because I think it will get really bad. And I think in order for things to normalize, you have to have a forest fire. You have to, to remove all of the misallocation of capital out of the system. But in doing so, the whole system that has been propped up and overly uh, inflated comes crashing down to a level of fair value. And, and, and what you have seen through all of this is a K-shaped recovery, I guess you'd call it that, where the wealthy are getting much wealthier because what has inflated more than anything is asset prices. The wealthy are the people that own assets. The poorer people don't own any assets. So what they are witnessing is inflate, inflated uh, basic necessities, uh, energy and food. Uh, ironically, those are things not counted in the CPI. Um, and um, basic everyday needs and consumer goods are rising where <laughs> the, the lower income people are, are basically paying a hefty tax on, uh, because of this inflation where the wealthy don't really care because their assets that they've accumulated 
are continuing to go higher in the face of, of these in, inflated asset prices. So, you know, at some point, the wealthy are going to get scared and they're going to realize that a lot of this is really not justified and um, they're going to sell, which will only make asset prices tumble further. Uh, and then you get, you get a, a, a very bad situation for a lot of people who have, who have come into this chasing returns that they think are normal. You know, the, the market returns that we've seen over the last few years are not normal, Alex. In a normal market, if you're making four or 5% per year, you're a rock star. You know, uh, you don't make 100%. You don't see markets that go vertical uh, for anything sustained or prolonged. And um, a lot of people, that's all their only exposure to this market. So I, I think the big money, the insiders are probably already selling, lots of insiders selling, but the smart money will sell on strength. And as Jim Rogers has said, you know, one of the leg most legendary investors, you sell on strength, you buy on weakness. And uh, you look at something like silver, which is massively accumulated, uh, which is needed, which has demand both monetarily and industrially, maybe the only commodity that really is bracketed on both sides by this demand, which is cheap, should be buying uh, equities and things that have had this massive rally uh, that aren't justified should be sold. You know, I was listening to George Gammon the other day and he had a great, a great uh, analogy he, he, the analogy was of a hot air balloon with a little basket underneath. And if you think about it, the economy should be the hot air balloon and the basket should be the stock market that mirrors its movements, right? Now, if the economy crashes, so does the basket underneath it. But what we have now, and if the economy goes up, so does the basket, right? But what we have now is this perversion where it's upside down and the basket is now um the economy and the balloon is the stock market and the economy is not justifying the all-time highs in equity prices so there will be a moment in time alex where people have this spiritual experience where the realization that if it's too good to be true for a prolonged period of time i got news for you history has shown that it probably is so um you know I, I think what the Fed is doing is only making things worse ultimately, but kicking the can down the road, uh, only making it worse for your future. That's for damn sure. Yeah, I agree. It seems like kind of like what you were saying, the Federal Reserve is only interested in its own power, its own sway over the government. So a really big question for me is how are they going to keep their power? What is their plan in the future so people can prepare for that? It's a good question, um, and, and it's one that I really don't know because, truthfully, I think the only way that this ever gets better is uh, like that forest fire analogy to to clean out all of the misallocation. And I think the only way that that even happens, Alex, is if the dollar is no longer the primary world reserve currency, and uh, because. How long can we, our creditors continue to accept the, 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 the currency from the largest debtor nation in the history of the world as the world reserve? At what point do they move away from accepting or wanting dollars uh, in favor of something else? Special drawing rights, uh, backed by gold, um, a, a, new, a new BRICS nation currency, a digital yuan, backed by gold, I mean, this is why I talked about, to me, the relevance of gold being reclassified as a tier one. Because why would they have classified tier one if not for it to be part of the system? The only other tier one reserve asset are US dollars. And it's been that way since 1944. So the fact that the Bank of International Settlements reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one tells me that it has a vital role in what's coming next. But how does the Fed play into all of this? I don't know. Look, they've proven throughout all of time that they, since 1913, they're very powerful. And people who get in their way end up gone. Uh, and so um, 
Don't know. It's a good question and one that remains to be seen. But I think that this is the problem of U.S. We think in terms of days and weeks, and we have a, a an economy built on debt. And uh, you know, I think you look at a country like China, and they're planning uh, in terms of decades and and building an economy built on assets. Um, yeah. Uh, I so I think you're seeing a shift. There's an old saying that he who has the gold makes the rules. And if you look at the amount of, of gold imports going into China, they're the largest producer. They don't sell an ounce. Um, they're the largest importers. I think what you're witnessing is a slow transition of uh, world superpower dominance, singular dominance away from the West to one of at least more of a power sharing uh, situation eastward. And, um, and I'm convinced of that, especially now that we see them embarking upon the Belt Road Initiative, which is connecting 70% of human population, all of which, most of which is settling on the new Chinese digital one. The long game doesn't bode well for the dollar and the, the monetary decisions that the Fed is acting or, or has, has is doing is only making things ultimately worse yeah you know i think where it really comes down to is the people because you know people make the governments governments have a lot of power but i think people you know like assets better i think you know an asset-based economy would be a better economy because if you look at it basically in every country you know people see you know a government stamp as value pretty much all around the world so i think that there could be I don't know, like a, a counterattack basically where we're going back to assets, you know, to goods or services, you know, like gold and silver and other things like that. I think that's why China is moving, building all these cities out of nowhere because they don't want to keep their dollars. They want to build assets. So I think you're right that assets are the are the way of the future. But, but, but you know, not, they're not just building these cities. They're building 12 airports a year. They're bridges, they're roads. Uh, they... Um, are investing all around the world. And they're, you know, they're buying up corporations here in the United States. They've bought the, the biggest uh, pork processing plant in South Dakota, it's bigger than anyone in the, in the country. They're buying up everything. And not only that, now, as we talked about, the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative, when you talk about an internal infrastructure with these ghost cities and new airports and roads and bridges, this external infrastructure all the things that they've been buying for years are now connecting Asia and Africa, 70% of human population, 45% of global GDP before they industrialize it all. Uh, they are building a culture based upon assets. And there's an old saying, Alex, that assets feed you and liabilities uh, um, eat you. And, you know, you, you want to... Um, want to accumulate assets and that's exactly what they're doing and they're playing the long game it's very very obvious that that's what they're doing so um when you realize that gold was reclassified tier one and they you know alistair mcleod uh, i don't know if you know who he is but he's a very very smart man maybe one of the best minds in this industry came out a few weeks ago and said that he believes that they have thirty-eight thousand tons of gold 20,000 owned by the state, 18,000 by the people. That would be nearly five times what the U.S. is supposed to have held at Fort Knox. That would be many times the largest position in the world. So if gold is reclassified as tier one and they own that much of it, look, with our trade imbalance, they've been mining gold that was uneconomic, uh, uneconomical to do so for years. They've been mining gold that probably cost them 3,000 bucks an ounce to pull out of the ground. They don't care. They are gaining assets to feed themselves. They own the lion's share of all the rare earth metals that are used in batteries and whatnot. Um, and they're buying up everything while we go further and further into debt and are more fixated on gender equality and all these woke topics that you know, I, I think that we're, we're, our eye is not on the ball. Theirs is, put it to that. So Andy, so a really big question for me is we see, you know, China, what they're doing all across the world and everything and how they're becoming pretty powerful. And we know that holds pretty big implications for us here at home here in America. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, what would you do 
uh, say if you were able to, um, how would you fix America? How would you keep it, um, you know, a really good country? What would you do to stop? You know, I think um, that's a tough, a very tough question, obviously, Alex. But, you know, I think I am a libertarian at heart. One of the things that I would do is arguably I would close every military base around the country, around the world. I would bring all of all of our uh, soldiers home. I would spend more time protecting our borders. Uh, I would use the money that we are spending all around the world in a wasteful way to uh, improve our infrastructure. I would um, uh, find ways to incentivize corporations rather than uh, penalize them with restrictions to manufacture here in the United States, to uh, look for ways of growing uh, an economy that is more self-sustaining. Uh, I would uh, make the hard decisions, I guess, if I had to, uh, whereby you start cutting programs and getting out of debt. And, you know, we've gotten to a point now where no one wants to cut anything because uh, the backlash. Well, you know, no one ever wants to cut back, but if you can't afford it at some point, you have to. Now, we are... Uh, probably already the place where there is no return, Alex, we're $140 trillion in the hole. And uh, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. And heaven forbid interest rates rise, then what? So I think you start by making the, the tough decisions um, and incentivize people to produce rather than consume. Um, you know, we're seeing that again where, you know, uh, a debate about these um, subsidy payments, the stimulus checks that people keep getting. I hear over and over and over again from clients of mine who, you know, entrepreneurs, they say, look, I can't even stay in business. I can't get anyone to work for me. And uh, people are getting paid more money to sit at home. Uh, you know, when you talk about the $600 check plus unemployment, they're making more than they did when they were gainfully employed. And here again, this is just um, destroying the middle class. It's destroying the small business. And it's spending money that we, you know, we don't have. And it's just more of the same problem where um, we have this privilege as the world reserve currency, I guess, to stuff the box with IOUs. And, and that's, you know, at some point, uh, they're gonna come looking for, you know, pay me. Here's my check, here's my bill. And it, either we default or we continue to inflate away because paying it off, I don't think is an option at this point. Yeah, so what do you think would happen to the world if America just inflated its debt away? Say they just print trillions and trillions of more dollars or whatever amount they chose since they have the power to print. Well, that's what they're doing. So what do you think? So that's what, what they're do doing. Now? They've printed $9 trillion that we know of since September of 2019. That it took almost 300 years to create just under a billion, a trillion dollars in this country. And they've printed nine times that in a year and a half that we know of. So, or two years. So, um, I think the world will move away from the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency. Uh, look, our... Our style of life has been fostered really by the good grace of our foreign creditors. And, you know, I say to you again, how long before those, those creditors and the rest of the world says, why would we take this as, as money for our goods and services? And they look to a new place. Now, arguably the dollars, the, as Doug Casey says, the prettiest mare in the slaughterhouse. Uh, it's the best of the bunch, but here again, why did they reclassify gold? Is there something under the surface? Are the Chinese going to issue with their digital back yuan? Are they going to peg it to gold? What would that do immediately? It would The dollar would absolutely collapse as the world would run to an asset-backed currency, something that was tethered, rather than a debt-based currency that is being watered away uh, day by day. So... 
Um, I think we're closer to that than most people would think. And when you say what would happen, well, that is what they're doing. You know, the amount of money creation that they have, have already embarked upon uh, is it, crazy, you know? And um, you're, you're looking at more money that he wants to spend in the infrastructure pro, uh, uh, programs. And look, in order for the Fed to normalize things, if you realize there's 6% inflation by their CPI, they'd have to raise interest rates to over 6%. Um, and they're talking about maybe raising rates 25 or 50 basis points in two years. It, it's, you got the Fed saying it's transitory, but it isn't, you know, the Fed can only hope it goes away on its own, but it, it's not. They're only making it worse by holding interest rates low because 6% interest rates in this economy, it's all over. Everything collapses. So it's, it's a problem. And uh, I think this is what they're doing. And now we'll see how the world reacts and how far the Fed takes it. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised, you know, countries like China haven't uh, gotten rid of the U.S. dollar yet. Do you think they're just scared of the United States at this point? Or why do you think they haven't, you know, made their own reserve currency at this I point? I think they are putting all the pieces in place to do that. That's why they have the system that mirrors the SWIFT system that they have gone into. Most of the BRICS nations have signed on to it, as have many, uh, excuse me, um, as have many of the, uh, sorry, just got something flew in my eye. Um, as have many of the European countries. And uh, um, so that's why they also built the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which will challenge the COMEX. That's why they also um, have built the Chinese Petro Yuan, which is a bond that they use to buy natural gas and oil from Middle East and from Russia, and it's immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, they, that's why they're building these infrastructures. That's why they're the largest accumulator of gold in the world, and they, they are positioning for that. And, but yet they still own over three trillion worth of our assets and, and our treasury. So it would cut off their nose to spite their face, let's say, uh, I think they're biding their time um, and they're milking as much out of the system as they can because it's the trade imbalance that has enabled them to get to where they are. It's our trade imbalance, which is sowing the seeds of our own, I don't know if I want to call it destruction, but removal from the top of the heap as the single dominant player. And, um, you know, so I guess we'll see how it all plays out, but I do believe that's the way the trend is moving. Yeah, so when do you think China will make their move? Do you have, you think, uh, kind of an approximate time? No, but I would think it would happen once the dollar starts to spiral down the inflationary drain. They're not going to spiral drop down the drain with them, but I think they will wait until it's, it's kind of the ace in the hole. They'll wait until they have no other choice, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so could you... Uh... Did you have a special this week for gold or silver? Yeah, we have the 2021 um, United Kingdom Britannia at $3.95, I want to say, over the price of silver. And um, they're brand new. They're wonderful coins. Uh, come in tubes of 25 and boxes of 500. And um, from a standpoint of a sovereign coin, that being a coin issued by, by one of the six major mints, uh, it's as good as it gets. And it's probably the least expensive uh, I've seen these coins in a year and a half. So good buy. I think that'll be amongst the lowest price in the country. All people need to do is send me an email at Andy at Miles Franklin. Mention the Free American Press and I promise your listeners they'll get the best price in the country and whatever they want to buy it. Oh, well, that sounds great, Andy. Uh, was there anything else you'd like to add in this video? No, I, I just, uh, here again, I think, you know, people need, need to realize that 
things are not as good as we are being led to believe. If they were, the Fed's actions would be grossly different. And uh, they wouldn't talk about not stopping asset purchases uh, until uh, we see a normalization in uh, employment. And yet here you have politicians now saying, well, we're gonna continue to pay the, the, the CARES payment and only incentivizes unemployment, uh, disemployment, whatever you wanna call it. Um, so I think we're a long ways away from ever getting normal. And quite frankly, I don't think they can. That's what I'm getting at. <clears throat> 2019, they tried to normalize the market or, or their, their balance sheet, and the market collapsed. They can't ever really normalize their balance sheet without facing the repercussions. And so either it's inflate or default or go through some holy hell pain when the whole system busts apart. And, and I think that's why they have said for the foreseeable future, interest rates won't rise. And maybe in 22, 2022, they'll raise it by a quarter basis point or a half basis point. That's nothing. So um, I think people need to realize that now more than ever, buying precious metals, it, it, you just, the Fed just put a floor under the price of gold and silver by saying that they're not gonna stop asset purchases and they're not gonna raise interest rates. You could not ask for a more bullish statement by the Fed. So um, buckle up, I think the second half of the year is gonna be interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. I definitely think you're right. And when we move to that asset-based economy, you know, those, pa those pieces of paper aren't gonna be worth anything anymore. It's gotta be assets, you know, thing that you, things that you own that are gonna be worth the money. So. Uh, I have to agree with you, Andy, and I would like to thank you for being on the show again this week. Great to see you, Alex. We'll look forward to seeing you next Friday. You have a good weekend and uh, stay well. I'll look forward to catching up with you real soon, kid. Well, that sounds great, Andy. Thanks again. And thank you all. Thank you to all the viewers who are watching. God bless. God bless, Alex.